Hello and welcome back to Clinical Cases. So today we're going to be looking at the cases that we were taught about in the third week of the respiratory block. So these include haemothorax, rib abnormalities, tonsillitis, epiglottitis, cardiac tamponade, pleural effusion, emphysema and respiratory failure. So let's start by looking at haemothorax. So this is a type of pleural effusion. So what's really important is that there are several types of pleural effusion and essentially it's the filling of the pleural space with stuff that shouldn't be there. So it should be a thin layer of fluid that provides lubrication for the lungs to expand. Um, however, haemothorax is when that pleural space becomes filled with blood. So blood accumulates in that pleural cavity. The excess fluid can therefore interfere with normal breathing uh, by limiting the expansion of the lungs that, are, that is possible. Usually a haemothorax tends to occur following a blunt or penetrating trauma injury to the thorax. Um, but it can also occur following surgery, um, and sometimes it can be spontaneous as well, although this is less common. The patient will present with chest pain, a shortness of breath, um, a faster breathing rate, and other common presenting features. So when we say common presenting features, you're linking this to probably the cause of the haemothorax. So is it caused by a penetrating trauma? Um, have we got other symptoms that are linked to that? Um, so how does it happen? So this links back to understanding your basic anatomy. So understanding that your pleura, um, you've got a visceral and a parietal pleura, which is separated by a thin layer of serous fluid. Uh, and when a haemothorax occurs, that blood builds up in that space between the two layers, uh, which causes difficulties with lung expansion, uh, which causes the patient to be short of breath uh, and have a higher breathing rate because they're having to breathe more often to try and get as much air into their lungs as possible. It's usually diagnosed um, with a chest x-ray because uh, you can quite clearly see that there's a haemothorax there um, and usually the treatment is by removing the source of the bleeding, so draining the blood present in the thoracic cavity and this is usually done via a thoracostomy. So moving on we looked at some rib abnormalities and these were kind of covered in different lectures at different points um, in little detail but just to kind of bring them together, so a rib fracture uh, is a break in either the actual rib itself or the cartilage that attaches the rib to the sternum. So you think about the normal anatomy, you've got the rib coming round from the vertebrae at the back and attaching to the sternum at the front via some cartilage. So any break within that um, area is classed as a rib fracture. The most common cause is a direct blow to the chest, so usually this is from tra trauma such as a car crash or a fall. Um, alternatively, however, a hard cough can do it, especially if the bone's weak, so if the patient's suffering from osteoporitis, something like that. In terms of treatment, because it's quite a simple break, uh, usually you can support this patient just simply with pain relief, so NSAIDs, um, and ensure as well that their respiratory function is okay. Um, ensure there's no complications, so for example, it's not punctured of the lung underneath. Um, so a good way to assess this um, is that if a patient's broken three or more ribs, uh, they should be admitted to hospital. If it's an elderly patient that's broken six or more ribs, they should be admitted to ICU. Um, and the reason we do that is because there's a risk of internal organ damage. So, for example, that rib fracture could have punctured the lung underneath. Uh, also, you need to know about flail chest. So, this is a life-threatening condition, really, which causes the rib cage to break due to trauma. Um, so, essentially, you've already got um, a rib fracture, just like above here. Um, but it causes it to become completely detached from the rest of the chest wall um, and this causes the chest wall to move independently so it's quite um, easy to spot in terms of diagnosis because the chest wall is moving abnormally with the person breathing. The patient will also be in a lot of pain uh, in the chest area and will have shortness of breath. Uh, usually you'd give oxygen to assist the breathing and medication to relieve the pain and as well surgery will also be necessary um, if the rib has punctured the lung underneath. So tonsillitis is something else we were talking about. So this is inflammation of the tonsils. Um, it's quite a common thing. So a lot of people uh, really do suffer from tonsillitis, particularly when they're children. Uh, it's a type of pharyngitis. Um, so it's usually caused by a viral infection. However, it can be bacterial as well. Um, and when caused by the bacterium group A streptococcus, uh, it's referred to as strep throat. So this was mentioned in a previous video. Strep throat is um, a problem of throat caused by group A streptococcus. So it's very common, as we've said, a lot of people will get it within their lifetime. It causes a chronically sore throat, uh, fever, enlargement of the tonsils, and as well difficulty in swallowing. Um, so normally you can treat um, 
bacterial forms with antibiotics, so penicillin and amoxicillin are first-line treatments. Uh, however, you may add a macrolide such as rivamycin uh, for people who are allergic to penicillin. Virally, of course, there's no medical treatment um, because it's a virus that's caused it. Uh, however, paracetamol will ease the pain, and you can recommend gargling with salt water if that also relieves the pain for the patient. What's good to be aware of are complications. So if this tonsillitis goes bad, essentially, so you could have a peritonsillar abscess. Um, ENT, people refer to this as Quincy. So it's pushed due to an infection just behind the tonsils. Now, a lot of people say that exudative, um, so this is the basically buildup of spots, um, refers to it being bacterial. However, this is not the case. It's not specific, and it won't allow you to differentiate between bacterial and viral tonsillitis. However, a swab will. Um, sometimes tonsillitis can be misdiagnosed, so rheumatic fever is a serious complication uh, that can develop following an untreated throat infection, uh, so it's linked to bacteria, so uh, group A, streptococcus again, uh, it's very rare however in the UK, and it'll usually cause joint pain or swelling and inflammation of the heart, shortness of breath, chest pain. Um, one thing that's always important to remember, especially with things like the common cold or tonsillitis, the symptoms aren't caused by the bacteria. The symptoms are caused by the body's immune system's reaction to the bacteria itself. So next we look at epiglottitis. So the epiglottis, of course, is that flap at the base of the tongue that prevents food entering the trachea. Um, so epiglottitis is just inflammation of the epiglottis. So uh, if you see itis at the end of a word, it usually refers, refers to inflammation. Um, usually in terms of symptoms, usually very rapid in terms of onset and will cause difficulty in swallowing and drooling. They'll also have a change of the voice. Um, used to be caused by HIB, so H influenza type B. Um, this used to be the main cause of it. However, there's now a vaccine that prevents people from suffering from HIB, so it's very rare that someone will prevent with that being the cause. So therefore, other causes nowadays most commonly are streptococcus pneumoniae, streptococcus pyogenes, and staphylococcus aureus. Um, and it's also linked to crack cocaine use as well. Um, What's really important with these patients is that you do not examine the throat, especially with a tongue depressor, uh, because it could cause the vocal cords to spasm, uh, and it could, obviously, the patient's going to be in a lot of pain already in terms of difficulty swallowing, they're going to be drooling, uh, they're usually quite hunched over um, to try and aid their breathing. Um, so what's really important is do not examine the throat, because it's just going to cause some more distress to the patient, uh, which is unnecessary. Um, usually it's confirmed by laryngoscopy, um, but obviously, again, this could provoke airway spasm. So the best way to do it is a laryngoscopy but that's carried out in a controlled environment, like an operating room. So treatment and management, uh, the first thing that you need to do is airway management. So, of course, uh, ensure that the trachea is patent. You know, you, you can, um, that the patient can breathe. Uh, but this isn't always necessary. If they're not having any difficulties breathing, then this is not uh, an important thing to do. Um, however, antibiotics will be the main state of treatment. So... Um, there's some examples here, but again, you don't need to know about this in second year, but antibiotics are the main treatment for epiglottitis. So cardiac tamponade is something else that we were taught about. So this is when fluid in the pericardium, so the sac around the heart, builds up and results in compression of the heart. So it very much like you've got your layers of pleura, which surround the lungs, you've got the pericardium, which surrounds the heart. So this can also be a link to a cardiovascular disease. So Essentially, you've got the pericardium, which is a double-walled sac, uh, which contains the heart and the root of the great vessels. It's got a surface layer and a fibrous layer, uh, and encloses that pericardial fluid, which allows reduced friction when the heart beats. So the fibrous layer is the outer layer, made of loose connective tissue, and that's there really to protect the heart. And then you've got a serous layer, which is there divided into parietal and visceral. Uh, and the visceral layer is also called the epicardium in a lot of cases. Uh, the parietal layer is usually fi uh, fused to the fibrous pericardium. But essentially you've got these layers surrounding the heart, and a cardiac tamponade is when fluid uh, builds up and results in compression of the heart, meaning the heart finds it very difficult to expand fully uh, and function as it should. So the heart can't pump enough blood to the rest of the body when this happens, uh, and this can lead to organ failure, shock, and even death. What's really good to know is that death is actually from lack of venous return to the heart, not actually from blood loss in the body. So symptoms, uh, they'll present with shortness of breath, weakness, lightheadedness, and cough, hypertension, tachycardia, hypoxia, all the symptoms that really you'd expect a cardiac tamponade to present with. Uh, it's usually quite tough to diagnose because there's quite a lot of differentials. 
uh, and the causes are quite varied from trauma to cancer to kidney failure, pericarditis. Um, and it also in places such as Africa, not particularly in the UK, but TB is also a fairly common cause. Um, so the main way we're going to treat this is to relieve the pressure on the heart, so pericardio ascentesis, so we drain the fluid with a needle from the pericardial sweat surrounding the heart. Pleural effusion, so this has already been covered in quite a few different ways as we've been going through. So essentially pleural effusion is when we get a buildup of fluid in the pleural cavity which surrounds the lungs. Uh, we've already talked about a haemophorax, we've already talked about a pneumothorax, um, but just be aware there are other types of different types of fluid that could build up within that pleural space. Uh, quite broadly classifying them, you can talk about transudative, so watery pleural effusions, or you can talk about exudative, so protein-rich pleural effusions. Uh, so differentiating and understanding which one slots into which is quite a good way to categorise them in your head. Uh, symptoms, again, we've kind of covered this, but chest pain, a non-productive cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing are the main symptoms they'll present with. And again, you want to treat this with a potentially a photocostomy, so a small cut in the chest and then inserting that plastic tube into the pleural space to drain that fluid, to pleural drain, and photocosentesis as well if the infusion is really large. Uh, you might want to take a bit of extra fluid for testing. So next you can look at emphysema. So this is a lung condition that causes shortness of breath. Um, the air sacs, so the alveoli, have become damaged. Uh, and the inner walls of the air sacs weaken and rupture, creating larger air spaces instead of smaller ones. So the problem with this is it reduces the surface area of the lungs, and therefore it reduces the amount of oxygen that's reaching, reaching your bloodstream. Um, usually people who have emphysema as well will also have chronic bronchitis. So divide them up into types. So understand that a normal alveoli, a normal lobular looks like this. This is what a pan asinar looks like, and this is what a centrilobular, asana, uh, centrilobular emphysema looks like. So centrilobular, so this one on this right hand side, this usually occurs in the upper lobes, uh, and it occurs with loss of the respiratory bronchioles in the proximal portion of the asinus with sparing of the distal alveoli. This usually really occurs in smokers. Panlobular or panasinar, so this involves all lung fields, particularly all the bases, and this usually occurs in people with an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So, as we've said, it damages the inner walls of the alveoli, um, causing them to eventually rupture, reducing the surface area for gas exchange, causing difficulty getting that oxygen into the bloodstream. Patients will naturally present, therefore, with shortness of breath, and potentially a chest tightness that won't go away. They'll describe it as, so essentially, uh, a cough that won't go away as well. Um, so causes exposure to smoke and cigarettes is the main contributing factor for emphysema. Uh, however, other risk factors include low body weight, air pollution, and occupational dust. Lastly, we were taught about respiratory failure. So broadly classifying these, you can divide them into type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. So... It's as a result, essentially, of in inadequate gas exchange by the respiratory system, um, meaning that the arterial oxygen and CO2 uh, can't be kept at normal levels. So differentiating between the two, so type 1 is where your oxygen is too low and your CO2 is normal. Type 2 is where you have oxygen too low, but this time your CO2 is too high. So, essentially, oxygen is low in both type 1 and type 2. But the main differentiating factor is that CO2 is normal in type 1 failure, uh, but CO2 is high in type 2 failure. So different causes of these. Um, so type 1 is usually caused by obesity, spinal cord problems, pneumonia, asthma. Um, these should never progress to type 2, but occasionally they can do. Type 2 causes so these are muscle conditions such as GBS, uh, botulism, so food poisoning disorders, uh, muscular dystrophy, motor neuron disease, uh, things that are going to impact on that CO2 level and the respiratory failure. So patients will present with shortness of breath, sleepiness, headache, coma, and confusion. So these are typical presenting signs of someone who's got hypercapnia, too much CO2, so sleepiness, headache, coma, and confusion. Uh, and usually treatment comes down to ventilation, but it's really important to understand the difference between invasive and non-invasive ventilation and how we prefer to do non-invasive ventilation because there's less long-term complications. So that's everything for this video. Um, as always, if you have any feedback, please leave them in the comments below. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, and as well, please be aware that obviously this isn't all the information you need to pass your exams. This is just a brief whistle-stop tour, basically, of all the clinical conditions that we're taught about. Uh, and you're more required in second year to know about the pathophysiology behind it um, and why the symptoms occur. Okay, thank you very much.